Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Cisco Networking Solutions for Public Funding. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit your questions in the Q&A box, and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. You can also expand your slide area by clicking on the Maximize icon on the top right of the slide viewer. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the Help widget. I will now hand the deck over to your speaker, Jerry Martin. Thank you, and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Jerry Martin, and I'm a Senior Solutions Architect with Insight Public Sector, and I'd like to also th welcome you to our Cisco Solutions for Public Funding webinar today. So on our agenda today, uh, we'll be taking a look at the current funding status for 2021, Next, we'll have the Cisco and Meraki teams cover uh, networking technologies. Then we'll close with a look at the Insight team and how we can help you get to the next steps. So now for our webinar presenters. First, we'll hear from Carolee Murphy, Public Funding Advisor with Cisco, and she'll be talking about some fantastic resources that are available to you from her team. Next, uh, Sean Northrup, uh, Technical Solutions Architect with Cisco, will be taking us through some exciting new technology around Wi-Fi 6. Then Natalie Rockefeller, Virtual Sales Specialist, will cover Meraki's lineup of Wi-Fi 6 access points, the MS line of switching, and the MV line of indoor and outdoor cameras. And to wrap up our session today, I'll be back with you to share a little bit about Insight Public Sector and how we can help you take the next steps. So without further ado, Carolee Murphy. Thanks, Jerry. Can everyone see the slides? I hope so. I'm pushing them forward. Hi everyone, my name is Carolee Murphy and I'm the channel manager on the Cisco public funding team. We support Cisco sellers, so the folks at Cisco are partners and customers as it relates to grants, bonds, E-rate and stimulus. We educate on public funding opportunities, we align on customer initiatives with available funding and we provide sales enablement. Now that's really nice to say, So, but what do we actually do for anyone? Well, we do research and funding reports, project checks, and training and grant promotion. But what, what does that mean? Like, I'll dig in a little bit more. So when you are going through technology projects with your customers and you're getting to the point where you're trying to figure out how do we fund this project, you can actually reach out to the Cisco public funding team. We work with a third party called the Grants Office and we can run a comprehensive report on all of the funding that is available to that account. Once we get that report, we can actually meet with you and your customer and guide you on what funding source is the best one to pursue for that project. So I suggest taking advantage of that. It's a great service that Cisco um, provides. We also keep a pulse on all things grants, all funding, all public funding opportunities we keep a pulse on so that we can push out uh, anything that makes sense for technology projects for our Cisco sellers, our partners, and customers. We are a big team, so there's 20 of us. So really uh, reach out to us, um, don't be shy. We're, that's why we're here. You can reach out to us by pinging me on WebEx or you can email grantquestions at cisco.com. I made this slide and then recently I just read that it's uh, hard to memorize more than 11 words on a slide. So I'm, I'm really proud of this slide. Grantquestions at cisco.com. There are two things that I want you to know by the end of my presentation. I want you to know not to do funding alone and I want you to know to dream big. I just reviewed our team, what's available to you, why we're here. So you know that you don't have to do funding alone and you don't even have to memorize Anything that I tell you in the next five minutes, you can just reach out to us and say, what was that again? Or can you come meet with us? Can you help guide us through this? That's why we're here. And dream big, well, I'm about to go through a few slides to show you literally billions of reasons why you should dream big. So we could talk about funding for hours. There's lots of sources of funding. So I'm gonna focus on the stimulus funding, more specifically the ARPA funding, but any questions that I don't cover or if you have anything that you need to know, write uh, grantquestions at cisco.com. 
as you know, the original stimulus funding, it was passed just over a year ago before we knew sort of how the pandemic would unfold. It was centered around all the necessary activities in response to this pandemic that we were seeing last March, it was. Up until recently, the recently announced ARPA funding, CARES 1.0, the first round of funding, it was the biggest discretionary funding for government. For K-12 public schools, they were actually covered in all three rounds of funding. Non-public schools were covered in the second round of funding. And the state and local government, they were covered in the first and third rounds. ARPA was passed this past, this past March, and it had a significant investment in government that really allowed all levels of government to do what they needed to do. That was just a quick review of the, the three rounds of stimulus funding. I'm going to show you that slide again. I wanted to show you the actual naming conventions for the funding and just do a quick review. So K-12 received funding in all three rounds of funding. Higher ed received funding in all three rounds of funding. Non-public schools funding in the second and third round. State and local government received funding in the first and third round of stimulus funding. And the thing that I wanted to highlight is the numbers. So you'll see, I'll just do two of them. So in K-12, to you'll see that the first round they got $13 billion, the second round $54 billion, and the third round $122 billion. In state and local, you'll see the first round they received $150 billion, and then in the third round $350 billion. So I just want you to see so how the, the funding has unfolded. It's really interesting, and it's just interesting things that you can bring up with your customers when you're talking to them. Okay, just to manage your expectations around what I'm gonna cover. So I'm gonna go over just some interesting highlights around education, K-12, then I'm gonna cover some highlights around higher ed and then state and local. Hopefully you'll still be awake by the time I'm done. So you can see there are multiple sources for funding for education. Uh, you can see there's E-rate, there are the year-over-year -year grants from the federal, state, and local ongoing grants, and you have your COVID stimulus funding. That is what I want to highlight. So the first two rounds of the stimulus funding, it needs to be tied back to COVID, but almost everything connects to COVID. So WebEx for education, strengthening network security, security cameras, increased bandwidth, that, that all connects back. So for K-12, to you have what is called ESSER funds, which received funding in all three rounds of stimulus. Yes, you're going to hear me repeat some things a few times. It's just to help you learn it so you have things that you can discuss. All three rounds of K-12 to funding were called ESSER and all basically have the same guidelines. For every iteration of ESSER funding, technology was specifically called out. The deadline for both public and non-public schools is September 2023, actually. So um, it's an opportunity to be strategic. You've got a bit of runway. It's great to have conversations with IT directors. <clears throat> the Department of Education actually wanted schools to strengthen their infrastructure. They wanted them to strengthen their networks so that at any point, students can move in and out of a distance or hybrid learning model. The Department of Education actually provided 13 spending categories to help make sure required spending for a strong learning infrastructure would qualify. So, for example, you could upgrade your Meraki cameras. Those cameras actually tie into the legislation for K-12 schools that covers um, the safe return to class. So the superintendent needs to publish their safe return plans. So you could maybe connect the IT director infrastructure strategy with the superintendents and they, they have to follow those action items. So if you can help um, help with that, that's that could be a smart move. And the stimulus uses ESSA Title I calculation. It's a K-12 federal legislation for supporting underprivileged students to determine the funding distribution. The process for accessing the funds, it varies by state. There is a certification that is used to ensure the institutions are using the funding for the eligible uses. It's, it's quite a basic certification. You're going to hear me say this again when I talk about state and local, but basically you would just say, I'm promising to use the funding for the uses that it's eligible for. 
The Emergency Connectivity Fund is quite a popular topic lately. It is to support broadband internet activities for off-campus locations, students, libraries, hotspots, routers, and more connected devices. USAC is actually operating that program. It's 100% reimbursement for expenses incurred July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. Okay, I just said a lot. So how do we think about all this? Well, is there another way to think about this? Is there another way to digest this? So here's the, the easy way to think about it. When you're thinking about network infrastructure, think about E-rate. When you're thinking about collab and security, think about stimulus ESSER funding. And when you're thinking about devices, then think about the, the emergency connectivity fund. Again, I'm gonna give you this deck so you can have a look through all of the eligible uses, really see the language that you're gonna see is the main theme is a lot of things qualify for this funding. You'll also get this slide with some use cases and potential solutions that you can go through. All right, next topic, higher ed. So higher ed received 40 billion in their third round of stimulus funding. The first round was 14 billion. The second one was 23 billion. Just uh, percent goes to student aid, 50% to institutional needs. But some highlights are priorities included things like distance learning technology and expenses due to coronavirus. Every single school receives something. The thing with higher ed, it's a shorter spending guideline compared to K to 12. So higher ed actually needs to spend their third round of stimulus one year from when they receive. So they'll have to spend their funding by May 2022. For their first two rounds, they have to spend that by January 2022. So I think I told you that for K to 12, they have till 2023. They can be a bit strategic and think about how to strengthen their networks. Higher ed, shorter timeline. And the thing that's repeated over and over is just investing in security and strengthening networks. And we'll give you all this content so you can check it out. Before I go to state and local, I just wanted to show you this site that you can have a look at. And it basically shows you uh, what has been reported and what has been reported as being spent, sorry, what has been allocated and what has been reported as being spent. You can come here and sort of look at the fund. So ESSER, GEAR, here, all the different levels of funding and see what has been spent. Just a couple of things I want you to know though, it, this is not uh, updated as fast as we like. So it's not up to date fully, but it gives you an idea. And you'll see that higher ed, they're reporting updates a bit faster. They have uh, one less step they have to do, so their updates are faster. It's not real time, but it is an interesting guideline. Okay, state and local. This is actually um, my favorite section. So <laughs> state and local has $360 billion allocated to them. And the real meat is in column one and two, the state and local fiscal recovery fund. And what I wanna highlight is the relatively open nature when it comes to this funding and their long runway to spend it. So when you look at the slide, you'll see that there's almost $8 billion for states in D.C. as well as tribal nations and $130 billion for local governments, for all levels of local government. Every level of government has something earmarked for them. It's formula-based based on a modified community block grant methodology for pinning down the allocation. It's the first time ever everyone is working with, for working with something. It's, it's definitely a time to address any pain points. I think it's important to position this funding as an investment and not just a Band-Aid. My a colleague uses this analogy, he said, would you rather you know, fill a bucket that has holes in it or would you rather build a new bucket and fill that? State and local governments have until 2024 to spend their funding. So it's a huge opportunity to be strategic. Um, sorry to my peers, I, I love to get on a little soapbox right here. So this is an opportunity to imagine a better life when it comes to government. And it's you can imagine you know, securing remote work, citizen experience around inclusion, empowering public engagement, ensuring critical continuity of services, 
inclusive society when it comes to broadband and the modernization of work, addressing the digital divide and building trusted experiences. This is going to all be in the deck, so you can check it out and talk about it with your customers. But what I want you to know is dream big. Now is the time to talk about what's possible with your customers because the funding is there and it's pretty flexible. And now that I've said all that and said, oh, dream big, the funding is flexible, I'm going to give you a couple of serious things to think about. So the funding will happen in two payments for state and local. Uh, for the larger governments, they receive their first payment in May and, and their second uh, installment will happen next May. And for smaller governments, they receive their first installment in June and they'll receive their next installment next June. So it's good to know when the money is flowing, when people have money. So there should be recent installments to both large and smaller governments from May and June just passed. This money is non-competitive. It is earmarked. It is there for the taking. So when you're talking with your customers, you can say the money is there. It's there for them to use. There is a certification process, which I mentioned earlier, and it's basically a process that says, I promise to use the money the way I said I would for the eligible uses. So you can't use the funding to go on a golf trip. That, that can't happen. All right, I just wanna take a moment, I'll send you the slides. You can see some of the language around the ARPA funding, but the thing that, that you need to know is just that it's flexible. It can be used in a lot of different ways and there's not a lot of hoops that you need to jump through. If you want to excite your customers, you can also show them the estimated allocations from the National City of Leagues. I'll share this link. Our team actually also, um, we host a one mob with the official allocations. We update it whenever we get new allocation lists from the grants office, so you can also share that. Uh, there are two things you can't use the funding for. So you can't use the funding to fund a pension system, and you can't use it to offset tax reductions, delay tax, or cover any increases. Okay, I know I said a lot, but we're going to give you all these resources. We're going to give you all the slides that I presented. There's all sorts of places you can look um, from our team around funding. We have sites, we have at a glances, we have playbacks, we have an allocation one mob where you can see the allocations, two pages of resources. So you can join us anytime. The thing you need to remember is don't do funding alone and dream big. Now I'm going to hand it over to John. Awesome, thank you. All right, guys. So let's. Um, I'm here to talk to you guys about Wi-Fi six. Um, and today, uh, Cisco's Wi-Fi six. We do support. We really like like to call it really the new normal. Um, and when we say Wi-Fi six. Really, what, what Wi-Fi 6 is today is requiring a lot more. I just want to make sure we're, you guys are seeing the right screen here. I think I'm seeing it bounce around on me just a second. <clears throat> Maybe. To the right one. Sorry, guys. I'm a technical engineer, so doing slides is very difficult for me. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think we're on the Wi-Fi 6 slide. All right. So um, Wi-Fi 6 today, um, uh, Cisco really likes to call it kind of the new normal. Um, and the reason is, is because uh, technically what we're seeing in the industry is, is that um, we have a lot more requirement for high performance, high throughput uh, devices and uh, software requirements. And even if we don't have a lot of high throughput requirements, there's definitely a need for higher capacity because there's a lot more devices that are coming onto the wireless network. And really that wireless network is becoming that main thing you're accessing versus connecting to a wire, right? We have, um, I love to have a little demo, even though it's, uh, we're not in front of you, we've got everything from Meraki cameras, right? These be, can be connected wireless. We've got things like uh, your Meraki sensors, right? So everything from a door sensor to uh, climate sensors. 
We've got other kinds of vendors, client sensors. We've got watches. We've got all kinds of different things that are connecting to the wireless network today. And we really like to see the Internet of Things. And these Internet of Things are just demanding a lot more connectivity, whether it be throughput, but also just um, basic connectivity to do things really quickly to come on and off the network, right? And because of that, um, wh one thing we really would like to think of is that Wi-Fi 6, if you just think of Wi-Fi 6 as an access point, you're really missing the bigger picture because an access point is really only as good as that network that it's riding on, right? So Cisco today, our, our actual infrastructure that we have to run our Wi-Fi 6 solution is completely refreshed from everything from our campus uh, switches from the access layer from our 9300 to 9400 uh, series switches, everything from our 95 to 9600 at our core, and then everything that would be running these APs at a 9800 series wireless LAN controller point of view. But really, the bigger picture here is that we want to make sure that the clients, if you look over kind of on the left side of this slide, the main point is to make sure that we have good client performance for the applications that you guys actually care about, right? All this other stuff is really just there to make sure that the application and that user experience is bang on, right? And so really, we really want to think of this as, as a big whole solution, not just a Wi-Fi 6 access point, okay? And to that end, we have done some recent testing around throughput from an access point, right, to a switch to see what happens if we really try to push the bandwidth on our access points. And we've done testing where we can get way over a gig of throughput, right, if it's really required from what you guys need to push through those APs. And so because of that, since we are pushing and have the capacity to even double that speed, Really, Wi-Fi 6 is driving the need for more than a one gig throughput to that switch port or multi-gigabit. So we do have the technology now to be able to run multiple gigabits of throughput through one cable without even refreshing your cabling infrastructure, okay? And our switching infrastructure that we actually have refreshed today has the ability to do that all the way from that access layer from the 9300 switches up to the 9400 switches at, at more of the core, the, the 95s. So we can actually do multiple gigabits through that. And if we don't get to that multiple gigabit speed, we don't think about that as a bigger picture. Down the road to the life expectancy of, of your purchase, if you start bumping up to that limit um, of that one gig on a switch port, you can start to see poor performance on the applications because we get a lot of resends and a lot of challenges in that in the the application itself. Okay, so we do have today a complete refreshed portfolio of all of our access points from previous generation to now Wi-Fi six. So everything from a 9105, which is more of a you know kind of a spot fill, I need an access point over here, all the way up to our flagships, which is the 9120s and 9130 series access points. And we also have an outdoor access point, 9124, uh, that can be placed outdoors and it's fully rugged to be able to place right out in the wild. Um, and so all of these access points are controlled um, by a wireless LAN controller, uh, 9800 series. It can be literally run in any way you see fit, whether it be physical appliance, whether it be a virtual installation on your own VM infrastructure, or even if you want to put it up in the cloud in AWS or Google, right? So pretty cool. It can be run in many different ways. Um, also, I would, would call out that if we're looking at uh, our Wi-Fi 6 access points, the real key to get the performance and understanding of what's happening on your network is to be able to see with analytics. And today, on our 9120, 9130 series access points, we actually have our own custom silica chipset built into this access point that can actually give you information that no other access points can do in our portfolio. What it actually is, is the RF ASIC is an actual extra radio that sits there right on that AP, and it can listen to what's happening in your environment. So we can hear things from interference. We can hear things that not only what that interference, where it is, what it is to tell you what's happening. We can hear things that then at that point can be pushed to give you more analytics to deal with that interference, right? And it's important that if we, if we can't hear what's happening outside of just basic connectivity, 
and we don't know how to change to another channel to get you better performance when there is a problem, okay? So that RFA stick is a big deal because you really have a full spectrum analyzer that is sitting there right on that AP doing work for you. And what it's actually also able to do is actually pump that intelligence and analytics up to a platform, which is called DNA Center, to give more information for you to deal with those things that we can see. And we can also do things like uh, intelligent packet capture. We can, pack, we can literally do a packet capture in the air with the RFA stick. And on these APs, we also have uh, some pretty cool innovations with some manufacturers, Apple and Samsung, just name a few, that we do special things with them to help improve those clients actually work better on our specific access points. And I'm actually going to show you a couple things here in just a second about how that actually works. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to jump into a quick demo. And let me share my screen here. Maybe. And here we go. So guys, give me just a second. Okay. Let's see if you can see my screen now. Maybe. Give a Not thumbs yet. up or yell at me. Not yet? No. I'm going to try one more time. No. Well, we can blame it on Wi-Fi, guys, because I'm over wireless, right? Isn't it? It's always Wi-Fi's fault, isn't it? It usually always is. Let me see if there's anything else I can try real fast. Uh, I'll tell you what. So for time, uh, why don't we do this? I might actually try to fix this and then um, – Natalie, do you want to go ahead and go through slides, and then if we have time at the end, I can do a demo to, to show this, if I can make it work? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sean. Okay. Wonderful. So thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today. My name is Natalie Rockefeller, and I'm a virtual sales specialist for Cisco Meraki. So I actually work exclusively with K through 12 school districts, local government entities, and higher education institutions. And I'm very excited to tell you guys all today a little bit of how we're aligning Cisco and Meraki Technologies with ARPA funding and CARES Act, and then also talk through a couple of customer case studies. We're gonna do a quick product overview on some of our newer technology, and then hopefully be able to share my screen with you guys and show you a quick bit of a demo. So. Again, how is Cisco and Meraki aligning with ARPA funding and how are we making sure our technology fits into these initiatives? We've kind of built this out into two overarching themes. So the first would be, of course, facilitate safety and security. And so again, how we're aligning our technology with some of these initiatives would be to create a safe and secure learning environment by blocking any threats to the network, whether the device is on or off the network. And so this, of course, comes into play with distance learning, with remote site management, and, and several other use cases as well. And then to protect data, whether that's research or intellectual property and being able to provide that secure access, again, whether an individual is on or off the network. And then the last piece here under facilitate safety and security would be of course, video surveillance and physical security. So protecting our students, our staff, our community with video surveillance. And with Cisco Meraki security cameras, we're actually able to provide analytics and we're able to monitor campus activity, understand social distancing, really where we're seeing our students or our, our citizens spend the most time within any given space or area. So again, we can ensure that social distancing is happening and that at the same time, we're being able to detect threats faster. And then of course, back to K through 12 and higher education here, we wanna be able to create hybrid learning environments. 
And so how we're gonna be able to do this is to expand teaching and learning environments across both virtual and physical campuses and classroom locations, and then addressing the digital divide throughout our communities, right? So this is something that was really highlighted with the pandemic is how many students and, and how many people didn't have that access to wireless at home, which made virtual learning, which made remote work very difficult. And so with Cisco Meraki, we of course are Cisco's cloud-based technology. So what Sean just covered earlier being on-premise, Meraki of course simplifies that. And what we do is that we're able to provide hardware and a license so that any, any person managing a network is able to view, troubleshoot, manage, configure, both whether they're on-site or off-site, so again, we were in a unique position to really help support our customers through the pandemic, right, where everything suddenly shifted and networks became much more distributed. So I wanted to share a couple of customer case studies and what we helped a few of our customers with throughout the state of Indiana. So the first would be Wawasi Community Schools. They actually had many, many students in rural areas who had no access to internet at home. So it made virtual learning very, very difficult for them. Oftentimes students were driving up to the campus in parking lots. But again, as Carolee mentioned earlier, we don't wanna provide a solution that's a Band-Aid fix. We wanna provide a viable long-term solution so that in the case anything were to ever occur, such as this pandemic again, that we would be ready to support our students, our, our citizens and everyone else to make sure that they have the, the access that they needed. And so how we are addressing this is we're working on a bridging a digital, a, the digital divide solution. So what we would do is take Cisco Fluid Mesh technology. It's essentially a wireless backhauling system where you take areas you can't traditionally get fiber to or you don't have fiber to, and you're able to push out a wireless signal with their patented wireless technology. And so we pair that with Meraki outdoor access points, essentially what an end customer or a client device could actually connect back to. And so we're able to push out wireless across several underserved areas. The next one would be here, Marion Community Schools. And their problem was very similar to Wawasee. Many of their students did not have wireless at home. So what we did is we created hybrid learning environment kits for them. And so these were Wi-Fi kits that included small eight port switches, a wireless access point, and a mobile gateway for cellular failover. And so they were able to, to put this equipment within community centers, so churches, areas that, that weren't being highly utilized, so that again, their community had a place to be able to go and get their work done. And then of course they would have that remote manageability where whether they were physically on site at Marion Community Schools, they were able to manage all of these several remote sites that they were creating. And then the last here would be Tinley Accelerated Schools. Their problem was that they were working with a very, very antiquated physical security system. They had cameras that were losing power, they had lost footage, and they weren't able to determine that until they were going to look for an incident that had occurred in question and the video or the footage wasn't there. So we're helping them facilitate safety and security by providing MV Meraki security cameras. So this is able to generate heat maps for them. So they're understanding at an hour by hour basis really where their students and their faculty are spending more time. So they know what resources they need to allocate to those areas specifically. And so they're, they're really able to also provide this footage back to their police department so with Meraki security cameras, we remove that need for an NBR or a place to store that footage and we have it directly on the camera. So you're really able to provide a lot of remote accessibility to people outside of the campus who need to have direct, direct view of that footage so they can again respond to incidents faster. And so the point here being is that every school district, every city, county, every higher ed institution is going to have a different need here and so we wanna work with you hand in hand to really make sure we're providing you with that viable long-term solution that makes sense to use your CARES Act funding towards. And then I know this is a bit of a repeat slide from Carolee's presentation earlier, but the great part is that having been covering these, these accounts for, for quite a few years now, this is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity where our, our school districts, our, our cities and counties are really getting the funding that they deserve and they need to upgrade their technology. So we have several other different public funding vehicles that we, we help our customers work through throughout the year. 
But we also want to be sure, again, that this is something that is always top of mind for our customers and that we're helping you work through ultimately. And then I know we promised just a quick, quick product overview here. So I first wanted to cover all of our Wi-Fi 6 access points. And the great part about this is that we have something for every single deployment, whether it's more of our entry level MR36 access point that you're putting throughout your classrooms, or maybe in areas where you have less high dense connections. And then we have everything up to our MR56 access points where we would put where those are, we see the most client connections and we're running the most, um, the most rich traffic over. And so really something for everyone here. We saw, of course, a lot of our Wi-Fi 6 outdoor APs be leveraged throughout the pandemic where we had many students being able to drive up to, to parking lots within the campus. So something for everyone here. And then MGIG switching. And I, I wanted to cover this specifically because I saw a lot of our customers shift over to Wi-Fi 6 um, last year through E-Rate and, and just over time. And this is something that really helps you maximize that Wi-Fi 6 technology is with that M-Gig switching backbone. So again, we have everything from some M-Gig ports to full M-Gig ports. But again, I, I've seen a lot of our customers really start to make those decisions to move forward and, and make sure their wired infrastructure is, is where it needs to be. And then the last piece I wanted to cover here, my favorite thing to talk about, really what I'm demoing most for my customers right now would be our MB security cameras. So again, we remove the need for that NBR and we put all the storage on the camera. And so it makes it incredibly easy to find a, an incident that's occurring where you can do things like motion search. You have heat maps that are generated for you, but this is something that we are putting a lot of time and effort into. And so the beauty of Meraki is that being cloud-based, you get everything that we're working on, all of our firmware upgrades, any security releases, any new tabs within our dashboard. That, of course, is pushed out to you as an existing customer. So I wanted to quickly and hopefully be able to share my screen with you guys, just in case anyone here today hasn't seen Meraki before, because it's much easier to show you rather than tell you. Can you guys see my screen OK here? Still see Can the I slide deck. Yep, just the slides. Well, I, I guess. Can. Oh, you can. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Well, I hope, I hope everyone can see it as well. But just so you guys are aware and just to kind of get you familiarized, this is again what becomes your controller. So I can pull this up on my desktop. I can pull this up on our mobile app. So for wherever you are, whether you're on site or whether you're remote. This is, again, how you're going to be able to manage, configure, and troubleshoot. And really the differentiator of Meraki in this, this cloud-based era is that we have everything from our firewalls, our security here, switches, wireless access points, mobile device manager. We have security cameras, sensors where you're able to determine what's happening within your network closet, and then Meraki Insight, which is, of course, able to give you more information in terms of the web applications that you're hosting and your internet service provider connection. So everything under one roof, which makes your life so much easier, you're spending so much less time on network management with this GUI type interface. And so again, this is what we're looking at very, very high level. I can see every single network that is connected back to our Meraki headquarters. So instantly I'm gonna know if anything is offline or alerting. And so as an IT director or someone who's managing the network, you know offhand if anything is happening. And then if I were to go in and click into a specific network here, let's say our San Francisco office, our headquarters, where it all started, I wanted to show you guys all of the changes and things that are happening with the Meraki dashboard. So as you guys can see here, this is something, the health tab up here, this is new. So this was pushed out again as you upgraded your firmware, but I instantly know from my uplinks to my firewall, to my switches, to my wireless, that everything is online, healthy, and running well. Of course, if you guys had anything that was alerting or offline, you'd have that instant notification there. And then we get really granular here in terms of our clients. I can understand every single web application that's being host of, hosted over the network, how much bandwidth is being allocated to that. So as an IT director, say, of a K-12 school, I can instantly say, Maybe there's Netflix very high up in here and we wanna scale that back a bit. 
you guys have all of that customizability and that ability with the Meraki dashboard. And then I wanted to show you our wireless health page. So this is again, something that we, we newly created and was pushed out to all of our customers. But this is really amazing because it takes the guesswork out of it for you in terms of troubleshooting. And instantly I'm going to know through the actual connection process where we're seeing any sort of failure of, of connection. So as you can see here, about 24.4% of the time we're having a failure to authenticate. And if I scroll down a bit, I'm now understanding if, is this an issue by my SSID? Is it by specific client? Or is it by specific access point within my network? So again, it really allows you to see those granular analytics in terms of what's happening on the network. And you can start to identify those patterns where maybe it's actually a user error and someone continuously is forgetting the guest network password. So again, takes that guesswork out of it for you. If I scroll over to the connection log here, I'm instantly getting a full list here of what exactly is happening and where we saw that issue. So as you can see, if I scroll down, Nicholas is having issues connecting back to the Radius server, and that's where we're seeing that failure to authenticate. So I wanted to show you guys from that very high level of the network connection down to very specific client device and, and why they're having trouble connecting back to the network. And then the last thing I'll show you before we'll kick it over to Sean here is going to be our topology page. And so hopefully this doesn't take too long to load, fingers crossed. But really what this provides you with is a automatically generated network diagram. And so it's going to tell you, and of course, if you're a full Meraki customer end to end, this is where you really see the benefits because I'm able to understand every single access point and security camera which switch port that's connected back to, which switch stack, where that's going out to the internet across our firewall. And so if I scroll down here, you guys can see this very intuitively allows you to understand how everything's connected back. And it's all color coded as well. So if you saw anything that was yellow, we'd be alerting, anything red, we'd know that we're offline. And if I were to click back into that specific device here, this would take me directly to essentially a peek under the hood here. I'm gonna see every single switch port laid out where I can actually go in and configure said switch port from this page here and a ton more information over the port traffic being passed. Our overall connectivity, I can run a pack, packet capture from this, from this tab specifically, run a cable test. So again, it's all very intuitively connected for you. So it makes, makes troubleshooting and makes management overall so much easier for you. And similarly today, we have so many amazing Meraki reps on our team here that would be and would love to cover any of this with you guys on a more individual basis. So, so please let us know if this is of interest and you'd like to learn a little, little bit more. And I'll kick it back over to you, Sean. Awesome. Thanks, Nelly. So let me see if I can get this to share one more time here. Still nothing coming through yet. Yeah, I did not, for some reason, guys, I am not able to get this to work. It looks like it is just not going to happen. The main thing I really wanted to demo for you guys is to show our DNAC appliance, um, specifically DNAC Assurance. Um, if you guys haven't seen that, really, uh, what what it, it what I was going to show is is the ability to have all this data that we were getting from our wireless access points to the actual network itself to be able to show what happens if, for example, you need to go troubleshoot something. The old way of doing it was very complicated and you really needed to be a, a, either a wireless engineer, network engineer to have any kind of concept of what's happening. But today, there's a much easier way. I even, with some of this kind of data, have trained in my previous roles when I've even worked um, in at a city, for example, um, help desk level people to be able to use an application like this to really triage um, the what is coming in so that we can send a ticket, for example, to the right engineer. 
um, so that you're getting first call resolution, you're not bouncing tickets around. It's very simple for a help desk level person to see what's happening inside the network with DNIC Assurance so that sometimes they can even fix the problem, right? They can even, even see what the problem is. Or if, the, if it is something that needs to be sent over to the server team or if it's something that needs to be sent to the network team or the wireless team, right, for example, or whoever is supporting that, that you can actually see in a very simplistic view of what's happening so that they can send it to the right place. Because I've in the past had that kind of problem myself as a support engineer where, you know, I'd get a ticket and it was like, well, it's actually the AAA server or it's, you know, DHCP or something like that. And, and you know, I wasn't supporting that. I was supporting the wireless or the network side, and then we'd have to bounce tickets around, right? So then the, the, really the customer has a real problem, you know, and a longer time for solution, um, as well as being able to have historical information. And we can see within 24, hour, or 24 hours a ton of detail. We can even go back up to two weeks so that if somebody calls in with a problem, we can see what has been happening, and we've captured that for the last two weeks even up to packet captures, live packet captures when we see a problem, especially in a wireless environment, so you don't have to repeat it, right? We can live capture that so when you go in to try to troubleshoot the problem, we don't have to have the user repeat the problem, right? Which is usually in a wireless environment what always, we always have to do. So I was going to try to demo that, but unfortunately I cannot even share my screen. <laughs> so sorry about that, guys. But if e anybody on the call, any customer, if, if you guys would like to just do a one-on-one -on -one session with me, I have no problem jumping on a call with you guys and walking you through what that looks like and the benefits uh, that you can gain from it. All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, this is Jerry Martin, Senior Solution Architect for Insight Public Sector, and we're gonna wrap this uh, webinar up today by just uh, going over a few highlights of what we do and how we can help you move, uh, move on to the next step. So at Insight, uh, we like to say we build meaningful connections to help organizations run smarter. And by that, we mean um, we want to get to un we want to understand your business and help you um, with this with uh, to develop solutions that help you solve your business needs. And um, Insight was founded back in 1988. And I think this slide is going to build. Um, and we were not just a reseller, but built around the hardware, hardware lifecycle services and distribution and integration labs and building true value for our customers through the mid 2000s, uh, developing into a full IT solutions uh, provider, right? So providing advanced network solutions and enterprise software integrations, working with our customers on their uh, on the first steps to uh, cloud migration and, and other digital strategies. And uh, today we are a much larger global intelligent provider. Uh, and we have several different uh, core areas that you're gonna see in the next slide around data center and cloud services and digital innovation and, and completely expanding our delivery of solutions for our customers. So we have uh, several key pillars of our business. Uh, supply chain optimization uh, actually underlies all of them, right? So we understand uh, that went back one second, sorry about that. So we understand that um, you know, supply chain optimization and supply chain security really underlies all of our business. And, it, and it's important to all of our customers to make sure that um, you know, the, the product that they're getting is not gray market or black market or any other thing like that. So uh, we have our connected workforce pillar um, helping our customers modernize their IT services. Uh, this is where we would work with um, those uh, school school districts that have you know a forty thousand unit one to one deployment for their students, right? So we could develop the solutions to to deploy and manage, stage all those uh, systems and get them deployed. Our cloud and data center transformation group uh, working around network security and data management, uh, doing cloud migrations, multi cloud support. Uh, data center migrations, building out data centers, building out complete data centers um, are some of the things that we do there. And then our digital innovation group, uh, working around AI and machine learning workloads. Some of the cool things that I've heard them do is uh, build out um, drone, autonomous drone systems that will fly a railroad track, right? And look for obstructions in the track and not just, not just see that there's an obstruction and send a picture back, but figure out, is it a down, uh, a crossing gate that shouldn't be down or is it a tree that's obstructing the track and be able to, to report in that. So some really innovative th things that they're doing there. 
So uh, we are a global company. We have reach all over the, all over the, the world for the most part and um, able to help using uh, insight delivered resources, partner delivered through our, our supply chain and uh, locations where we have offices. Closer to home uh, in the US and Canada, these are our office locations. We have over 3,500 engineers, uh, technical resources spread out all over this, uh, this geography right here. So we have the ability to be on site with our customers to deliver these uh, solutions remotely or however it makes sense for our customers. And then, uh, you know, again, we have broad expertise uh, um, across, you know, multiple layers of, of technologies across multiple vendors. Uh, we were, you know, work very close with Cisco and our Meraki partners to deliver the solutions you heard today and uh, uh, deliver those meaningful outcomes, not just as a, as a place where you would buy the product, but a company that will work with you, understand your business needs and help to de deliver those business outcomes that are required. So uh, I'll hand it off to our questions now, if we have any. And I don't see any in the chat right now. So I believe that this will conclude our webinar for today. Uh, this, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website in a few days. If you have any questions, please reach out to Insight uh, to your account executive. If you don't know who that is, you can dial 1-800-INSIGHT or go to www.insight.com and uh, we'll be happy to find the right person to help you out. I'd like to thank everybody for their time today.